Hi, Mike Gaben here with some more KSP math. In the original tutorial, I designed the Rescue 1 for a mission to get Bill, who had somehow gotten himself stuck in orbit. Thanks to the Visviva equation, I knew the delta V budget for the mission, but I needed to know how to calculate the amount of delta V contained in my rocket. In this video, I show you how to use the rocket equation for this, and then I show where the rocket equation comes from. So, without any further delay, let's do the math. Okay, how to calculate delta V in a vessel. I'm going to do this in three parts. The first part is going to present the formula and show you how to use it. Part two will derive the formula, but we'll skip over the calculus that is required. Finally, in part three, I'll delve a bit into the calculus behind the derivation. You are free to bail out at any point in this process. The formula we're interested in is usually referred to as Sikorsky's rocket equation, or simply the rocket equation. Konstantin Sikorsky, along with German Herm Hermann Oberth and American Robert Goddard, is considered one of the founding fathers of rocketry and independently derived this equation in 1897. As a point of fact, this equation was already worked out by the British William Moore in 1813. The m naught in the formula represents the initial mass of the vehicle, while the mf is the final mass after the burn. The ve is the velocity of the escaping exhaust relative to the ship. The ln is a function called the natural logarithm. I'll put a link in the description for those who are unfamiliar with logarithms. However, this form of the equation is not what's useful for use in KSP. That's because KSP doesn't give us the VE for our, their rocket engines, but instead gives us the engine's specific impulse. Thankfully, the two values are directly related to each other. The specific impulse, or ISP, is just VE divided by the standard gravitational constant G0, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. Knowing that the velocity is measured in meters per second and the G0 is measured in meters per second squared and doing the dividing explains why ISP is measured in seconds. Anyway, a little rearranging gets VE equals ISP times G0, and substituting gets us this more useful form of the rocket equation. Let's work out the delta V for my orbiter from the video. Looking back, the M0 was 7.65 tons, MF 6.85 tons, and the specific impulse of the engine was 345 seconds. Notice that, as we are dividing the masses in the formula, it doesn't matter what units they are measured in. Putting the numbers into the formula and pushing them through a calculator gets 373 meters per second for the vessel's available delta V. And that's it. With the rocket equation, you can work out the available delta V for any stage of your rocket. All you need are the starting and finishing masses and the ISP of your engine. If you happen to have multiple engines going with different ISPs, there is a formula for calculating their combined ISP, but I'm going to leave that for another time. That's because right now I want to show where the rocket equation comes from. We're going to derive the first version of the rocket equation. You may recall from the last video that the formula for calculating the delta V of a Hohmann transfer is based upon the principle of conservation of energy. This derivation is also based upon another fundamental idea from physics, conservation of linear momentum. Here we have a ship of mass m naught that is about to eject a mass delta m. As velocity is relative, it doesn't matter what the initial velocity of the ship is, and we can effectively consider its velocity to be zero. The ejected mass will leave with a velocity VE relative to the ship. Of course, the mass of the ship has now decreased by delta M. In addition, as per Newton's third law, a reaction force will have propelled the ship in the opposite direction. The ship's velocity will have changed by an amount delta V. We will now consider the linear momentum of each object. Momentum is calculated by taking the mass and multiplying it by the velocity. So the momentum of our ship will be m0 minus delta m times delta v. Similarly, the momentum of the ejected mass would be delta m times ve. And, as our initial velocity was effectively zero, these two quantities must add to zero in order for total momentum to be conserved. We'll rearrange this by taking the momentum of the ejected mass over to the other side. And then we'll simplify further by recognizing that m0 minus delta m is just our final mass. It would be really tempting here to just rearrange for the delta V, but that yields us an incorrect formula. We have to be careful. 
The issue is that the mass transfer does not happen instantaneously. The mass changes as a function of time as we burn fuel. We have to factor that in, and for that we need calculus. Let's get the time interval involved by dividing both sides of the equation by delta t. I'll then divide the mf over to the other side, as it's the delta v over delta t that I really want to concentrate on. You may notice that I did some reshuffling of the terms on the right side of the equal sign. Why I did this will become apparent in a moment. Let's carry our formula over to the next slide. We need to get rid of the delta t's, and to do that we integrate with respect to t. For those that have not taken any first year calculus, which is likely most of you, I do apologize. In the next part of the video, I will try to demystify these squiggly symbols a bit, but for now, I'm just going to blow on ahead. We'll assume VE is constant. It very well may not be, especially if you are traveling through the atmosphere, yes, even in KSB, but in the vacuum of space, this is an acceptable approximation to make. This means we can remove it from the integral, along with the negative sign. Now, if we let the time interval be very small, the delta t's and dt will come towards the same value and will divide out. On the left side, this leaves us with delta v, which is what we want. On the right side, we need to do some integrating, and after doing so, we're left with the negative log of m0 divided by m final. There was a bit of hand waving in that last step, but I'll get to that in the next part of the video. What's left is simply to cancel out the two negatives, leaving us with our rocket equation. Okay, if you're anything like me, you wouldn't have been too impressed with the hand waving back there. Specifically, how does this integral become the negative of the natural logarithm of the initial mass divided by the final mass? For that matter, what the heck is an integral? An integral can be defined in a number of ways, but for our purposes, I'm going to define it as an antiderivative. Now I need to define a derivative, but thankfully that's easier than an integral. A derivative is simply the rate at which something is changing. Motion at a constant velocity is likely the simplest example to use. Let's say I'm moving at a constant velocity, and over a time interval of 10 seconds my position changes by 50 meters. My velocity would be 50 divided by 10, or 5 meters per second. Now velocity is the rate at which position changes. So I could also say that the derivative with respect to time of my position function is 5 meters per second. This gets more fun if the rate of change is not constant, but I think this gives you the idea. Just remember that a derivative is just the rate at which a function is changing. In saying that an integral is an antiderivative, I mean that the derivative of the result of an integration will get what was initially inside the interval. That is, I need to show that the derivative with respect to time of negative log of m0 over mf will get what was originally inside the interval, namely delta m over mf times 1 over delta t. Rearranged slightly, 1 over mf times delta m over delta t. To take derivatives, we need some rules. These are common rules from any introductory calculus course, so some of you have undoubtedly seen them before. If not, well, you can Google them. The first rule is that the derivative of the natural logarithm of x is 1 over x. Again, remember that derivatives calculate the rate of change. So if I had an equation with the log of something in it, and I wanted to know the rate at which that equation is changing at a particular value, I would just calculate 1 divided by that value. Rule 2 is commonly referred to as the power rule, and tells us how to take derivatives of powers. Finally, our equation is not in terms of time, but instead in terms of mass, which in turn varies with time. To deal with this, we have what is usually referred to as the chain rule. This says that you can take the derivative with respect to the variable in the equation as long as you then multiply by the derivative of that variable with respect to the variable you want. What I like about the chain rule is that, if you look at it closely, it almost proves itself. Alright, let's do it. By our log rule, if we take the derivative of a log, we just get the reciprocal of what's inside the log. However, by the chain rule, we need to then multiply by the derivative of what is in the logarithm with respect to t. I'm going to take what's inside the derivative on the right side and write it slightly differently so that I can use the power rule. Let's take this over to the next slide and apply the power rule, treating the m0 as a constant. 
This brings the exponent of the negative down to the front and reduces the exponent by 1, getting negative 2. Again, by the chain rule, we still have to multiply by the derivative of mf with respect to t. Combining the terms ahead of the derivative simply gets 1 over mf. And I reorganize the derivative into dmf by dt. But what is the value of dmf by dt? Remember that the derivatives measure the rate of change of something. If we assume the rate of change of mass is a constant, then mf will be the amount of mass loss, delta m, divided by the time interval, delta t, which, if you look back, is exactly what I needed the derivative to come out to be. Wow, four episodes in and I've already got some major calculus going on. But the rocket equation is a formula we will be using a lot, so I think it is worth it. Next episode, we'll be rescuing Bill, which means we need to talk about rendezvous. Thankfully, we now have all the math we need to pull off the mission. I hope to see you then.